Hi, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm also at Ohio State. Um, we're going to be talking about curriculum development and how those smart um, objectives are going to fit into a framework and how you can develop different educational uh, curriculum. And specifically for our talk here, there's going to be a framework for how you can incorporate technology into any of your educational activities. Um, so, uh, like I said, we are wrong way down. Excellent. Uh, so the framework that we like to use is this Kearns model of medical education. Um, Kearns, a medical educator uh, at Hopkins, this is the second, second or third edition of his book. Um, has anybody read it? By chance, one, a couple. Uh, if you're developing uh, educational activities, I really recommend it. It provides a really nice framework. Um, but our uh, presentation here is going to be based off of uh, his work that he's done. Nope, that was a sun button. Uh, all right. Uh, so first of all, um, the first time I read the book, I was like, why do I need this? I'm not developing like a giant medical school curriculum. Like I just want to put together something that teaches residents about X topic. Um, the first thing to realize is that curriculum applies to essentially any educational activity, large, small, a single lecture can be a curriculum. Um, certainly a workshop like this is a curriculum. Uh, so applying these steps in this framework to even small educational um, activities that you're designing can be really beneficial and can just help you make sure that you're ticking all the boxes and making it as uh, efficient and productive as possible. Uh, so these are our six steps here that we're going to run through. Uh, problem identification, targeted needs assessment, goals and objectives, educational strategies, implementation and evaluation and feedback. Uh, so we talk about them and we present them in a pretty linear fashion. Um, but the reality is that all of these steps really interconnect together and um, as you progress through the system from step one through step six, you'll notice that as you get to step three, which is a, our goals and objectives, you might think, well, uh, you know, as I'm developing these objectives, maybe, you know, I want to refocus exactly what it is that I'm doing and you'll go back to your original problem identification. And likewise, thinking about that problem identification will help guide your objectives, even though they're not you know, steps one and two together, they still impact each other. Uh, so certainly these are steps that are constantly revisited and impact each other. So step one's our problem identification. Kern's like a big 10,000 foot type of guy. So he really thinks of this as, what is the problem in society that, that you need to fix with your educational uh, initiative here? So an example, we developed a new stroke curriculum for our residents. Our, you know, 10,000 foot view was strokes are bad. We should treat strokes. Our residents should know how to do that. Um, but from there, you kind of whittle it down. So you say, OK, so emergency physicians should be competent to treat, treat strokes independently. Um, but what's our current approach? From our residents, we're a comprehensive stroke center, like a lot of you probably are, uh, which means our neurology residents and stroke teams do a lot of the actual stroke treatment other than I, the initial identification. So our residents don't get that education in managing TPA, making that decision, counseling, that sort of thing. Um, so what would our ideal approach be? Well, ideally, our residents would do that. But being a comprehensive stroke center, that's not possible. So, um, or maybe they can rotate on the service. Can we do a simulation? There are a lot of different ways that you can think about the ideal approach to, to fixing and addressing this problem. Then you want to think about what's your desired outcome. Our desired outcome would obviously be we want our emergency residents to be able to manage ischemic strokes independently as practitioners when they leave our program. Uh, so. This first step helps build your rationale for why it is that you're going to be devoting so many time and resources to developing your educational program. Uh, it can also involves a little bit of uh, literature search. So if you look on JEDM and you say, well, there's a really great TBL on ischemic stroke management, and that's really all we need. We're just going to use that. Um, that's great. It can help you from duplicating efforts. But if you look at it and you say, oh, this is great, but I want to add on and expand to it a little bit, it helps you do that too. I always want to hit that bottom button. It really kills me. Uh, all right. Step two um, is the needs assessment. Um, so <clears throat> you do a lot of this in step one in thinking about uh, the problem identification, and you do a general kind of needs assessment. I like to think of this as a needs assessment for my curriculum. What do I need to be able to successfully implement this? If I want to use simulation as part of my ischemic stroke um, curriculum, well, I need a simulation center. At the very least, I need somebody to act like they're having a stroke and some infrastructure in place to be able to run that simulation. Um, so this is, uh, what do my learners need? What does my learning environment need? 
Uh, what about the key stakeholders in my department or my medical center or my simulation center or my medical school um, who need to be on board with me doing this curriculum? Uh, and do I need monetary resources? Do I need technological resources? Um, and how can I get a hold of them? Uh, the way that you do a lot of this is through um, informal discussions uh, with mentors in your program who maybe have implemented curriculums like this before. Um, you can do formal interviews. Um, this is more of if you're developing a large curriculum for, say, like a medical school and you want to get medical student perspectives, you might do formal interviews with a select number of medical students. You can send out questionnaires or surveys. Uh, and finally, kind of the most intensive but probably most productive would be a focus group. Uh, that you get together to help you uh, come up with um, your curriculum. Step three is going to, yes? Has anyone looked into the idea of doing focus groups virtually? Because I, I feel like, you know, when we think about qualitative research, it really is about getting everybody in the same room at the same time. But when you're trying to do a needs assessment for something in your medical school, what you want to know is what the graduates are having a hard time with because they didn't learn in medical school. You don't want to know what your first and second years think they need to know. So has there been any study on like doing Google Hangouts focus groups? Uh, that's a really good question. I don't specifically know the answer. I haven't really studied it. I've read articles where they've done that. So I think it's just kind of accepted that that's totally acceptable as long as you still have a structured way of interviewing people, a structured way of collecting the information. It doesn't really matter what format you're collecting it in. Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely been used for, uh, focus groups have definitely been used, or virtual uh, hangouts have definitely been used for, for focus groups. I don't know if it's specifically um, been described for, for a needs assessment, if you will. So step three is our goals and objectives. Uh, so this is where those smart objectives uh, that Jeremiah was talking about really come into play. This is where you help define what exact learning outcomes you want your learners to have. Um, you want this to be representative of your broad curricular goals, uh, but that smart objectives help to make it more measurable, more definable, um, so that you can uh, better develop your educational strategies and measure success and failure of your curriculum. Uh, so a lot of people have talked about Bloom's taxonomy already this morning. For anybody who's not familiar with it, um, these are this is the hierarchy of level of understanding or development of information that your learners are getting. So the the first level here is going to be remembering. So it's kind of recalling facts, uh, then understanding, applying, analyzing, all the way up to create. Um, so uh, like we're talking about with the TBL. You know, the IRAT and the GRAT are usually kind of lower level Bloom's taxonomy, remembering, understanding, and then that um, group activity at the end is more of uh, applying, creating higher level, um, higher level work. So you want to keep this in mind as you develop your SMART uh, objectives, uh, in particular keeping in mind who your audience is. If you're just talking about um, medical students and talking about EKG interpretation, um, and this is their first ever exposure to EKGs in your curriculum, you may stick to remembering and understanding. If you're at an intern level, maybe you're going to want your interns applying and analyzing, and then uh, your upper level residents and faculty may be at the level of creating and evaluating. Be careful with your objectives. You don't want to be overly exhaustive with it. Uh, you want it to reflect the, the curriculum that you're developing, certainly, but if you're doing a half-hour lecture, you probably are not going to get through 20 objectives. Um, and you also don't want it to bog down what you're doing. You want to allow room for flexibility in your curriculum um, and to let the learners help drive what it is that they're learning.